Daf Mem Beis Amid Aleph. A couple of difficult Gemaras today to reconcile because there's a certain ambiguity that we'll see in a couple of different places, which we may have to just leave as ambiguous until we look in the postkin. Uh, but we're continuing our discussion of, uh, of what is considered to be a Sauda, what is putter through the making of Hamotzi in the course of the meal. And as you'll see, there are a number of different discussions that arise uh, uh, through, through, through this topic. Rav Huna Ochal Tleser Rifti. So the top line says that Rav Huna ate 13 loaves of bread that were B'nai Tilsa Tilsa B'Kaba. That each, each, loaf, each loaf was a third of a kav. So these, these were, um, these were uh, uh, quite sizable uh, 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 loaves. Now, uh, Rashi explains that this was Pasa Babakisnin, that these were Mazinus rolls. <coughs> essentially is what we would call them. They were mixed with juice and nuts and, and perhaps other ingredients as well. Velo Baruch, and as a result, he did not say Birkas HaMazon, because he felt, listen, it's just a Mazinus. It's not something that is meant as a meal. However, Amalei Rav Nachman, Rav Nachman said to him, Adi Kafna. He says, no, you ate this like a person who was filling up after a, a long fast, meaning that this was actually quite a sizable meal, and as such, uh, <coughs> if other people would eat that amount as a meal, then you have to bench after that. Now this is how we paskin, and it's very important for us to be aware that a lot of people think that as long as I just have mizainus, I don't have to wash, I don't have to make hamotz, and I don't have to bench, right? Like a pizza slice. Well, a, a pizza That's slice good. is a good example because pizza does qualify, according to many poskim, as pasta babakisnin exactly this type of food that we're talking about over here. And yet, if you use it as a meal, then you have to wash, make hamotzi, and bench. People ask me all the time about a tortilla wrap, right? Um, they figure, well, you know, a lot of people think that uh, it's not bread, it's made out of flour, but it's uh, mezainas, right? But if you're using it as a substitute for bread and it's the, it's the, it's the meal that you're having for lunch, then you have to wash and you have to bench on it. It doesn't matter how much you eat of it. It has to be used like a meal. If you're just using it like a little bit of a snack, and that's a, some, it could be somewhat subjective, and you see clearly even from the Gemara there's a certain subjectivity, but if a normal person would make that as a meal, and even if you're like a big bruiser and you, you just say, that's a, that Tell me a that, spice. You know, I, I eat a whole pizza. You know, one, one slice is nothing, but if most people use that as a meal, so then you have to... Uh, you plate of spaghetti and you wash and... No, no, no. Okay, so pasta is different. It's a good point, Bob. Pasta it, it is a special case because it's not like... It's not baked. It's cooked. And as such, no matter how much pasta you eat, uh, you, you never wash and make uh, hamotzi or bench on pasta. But the lasagna that's baked? No, li- no, no it's, it's the, the, the pasta itself is a baked uh, product. In other words, it's a... Uh, it's a, it's a, it's the the way that it's made is um, is not it's not made as a uh, uh, boiled. It's it's w- when they manufacture it, it's manufactured in such a way that it's never meant to be li- like a bread similar to a bread item. Uh, crackers, cookies, uh, p- um, okay. things that are mixed with other ingredients, but they're the baked. Noodles are not the same as the noodles for let's say lasagna. It's the same. It's the same noodles. No, but after it's made, you, that's when you're baking it. When so the exactly actual thing, when you eat food, you have lasagna itself. Yes, absolutely. If you if you have enough, that for a person, I'm going to have a cake for lunch. It's boiled. You have a cake for lunch. You have yeah. You have to wash and you have to bench. Not very healthy though. Uh, we know, your, mo- your mother would not be happy with you. Yeah, that's right. Okay, let us let us go weiter. Okay, Rav Yehuda have a le libre be Rav Yehuda bar chaviva. So Rav uh, Rav Yehuda was making some kind of simcha for a uh, chasana for his son in the home of Rav Yehuda bar chaviva. Aisu lekamayu pasa and they brought out for them pasa bobikisnen, and ki also sham inu de kamivarchi hamotzi. And when he came, uh, he heard that they were making hamotzi on, even though it was pasabo bekisnen. So Amr Lahu, my tzitzi de kashamana, what are these chirpings that I am hearing? Dilma, hamotzi lechem in haaretz kamevarchisu? Is it possible that you made hamotzi on pasabo bekisnen, on this mzoyna stuff? So Amr Lay in. They said, yes, we did. De Tanya, Rebbe Muna Amar, Mishum Rebbe Yehuda, pasabo bekisnen, mevarchen alav hamotzi. 
and they said, yes, we have a brisa that teaches that you are supposed to make hamotzi on Pasach of Bikistan. So the Amr Shmuel, Allah Kareb Imuna. And Shmuel had taught that that's the halacha. So Amr Luhu, ain halacha Kareb Imuna. And he said back to them, no, that's not the halacha. And in reality, you make a mezonus on Pasach of Bikistan. And in, in this scenario, it was not the Sa'uda. It was just as a dessert item. Or it was, you know, it was like a piece of cake or something. So itmar amri lei v'ha marhu d'armi mishmei d'shmu lachmonios ma'arvin b'hanu mevarachan lehem hamotzi. Aye, but didn't they say in your name, Rebbe? You said in the you quoted Shmuel. You, Rav Yehuda, had quoted Shmuel as saying that if you have lachmonios, and here that's not the lachmoniot that you buy in Israel. Lachmoniot that you buy in Israel, that's bread. Lachmoniot in the terms of the Gemara are a type of pasabah bekisnin that Rashi calls them like waffles, right? He says, Aren't, didn't you say that you make hamotzi, even though it's possible of the kisnin? So shiny hasam de kove se'uda say a He says, that's different. When a person is kove se'uda, when you make your meal over those waffles, so then you have to wash, make hamotzi, and bench. Okay? So the question would, of course, become, what about breakfast waffles? And then the answer would be, well, it depends how much you eat. If you have a whole stack of pancakes or waffles, and that's your entire meal, then there's an argument to be made, possibly, the taka you'd have to wash and bench on waffles or pancakes. Well, okay. you still make a in the No, no, no. You'd have to wash, make hamotzi, and bench. Yeah. But if you didn't establish a meal over them, so then you wouldn't, you just make a mezonis and then an alam alamitya. Rav Papa equal a bey Rav Huna bereda Rav Nasan, basar de gomar sudasayu, aisa le kamayu midi le mechal. So now we have another story with Rav Papa. And I just want to remind you, Rav Papa was quoted yesterday as saying that if at the end of the meal they bring out food for you and it's not, it's not tuffle to, to bread, so then you have to make both a pre-bracha and a post-bracha. And we have pointed out from Tosfus that we don't pass him that way because our cultural standards are different because today we all stay by the same table and there's always bread available throughout the meal, even up until right before benching. So this is the same Rav Papa now who says something that seems to conflict with what he said yesterday. What happened was is that after they finished the meal, they brought out food uh, after the meal was already over. So Shakal Rav Papa v'ka'achil. Rav Papa took a bite out of the food. So Amri lo savr lo mar gomar asr milechal. So they said to him, don't you hold that once the meal is over, you're not allowed to eat. Uh, there's two ways of interpreting this. Rashi says you're not allowed to eat. You have to bench first. And then you have to make a new bracha. Uh -huh. But it could also mean, according to Tosfos, that you're not allowed to eat without making a bracha. Because you got to make, you got to, on dessert you make a bracha. So Amr Lahu, see like Itmar. So Rav Papa responded to them and he said, no, that's only when they remove the trays. When they remove the trays, then you can't eat without a bracha. But here the bread is still with us. And remember, in those days, they would recline on couches and each person would have his own small, like, TV tray that uh, they would use for eating. So Rav of the Rebbe Zeira iklut lebe Reish Galusa. Rav and Reb Zeira came to the Reish Galusa, the Exilarch's home, and Lavasa de Saliku Taka Mikamayo. And after they removed the trays from them, Shadru lehu Ristina mi be Reish Galusa. Then the Reish Galusa had sent them. I guess, for lack of a better term, I would call it like Shirayim, like a Rebbe's Shirayim from the dish. The Reish Galusa said, "Here, I've sent you some some uh, some some food to eat, right? Like a piece of something." And the question was, would they, could they eat it without, without a, another bracha? So Rava achil, the Reb Zeyra lo achil. Rava ate it, and Reb Zeyra said, no, I'm not going to eat it because it's problematic because of a, making a new bracha. So Reb Zeyra says, don't you hold that once, you, once they remove the trays, you're not allowed to eat anymore. So he said back to him, he says, that's normally true, but since we're eating at the Reish Galusa's house, I had in mind that if the Reish Galusa would send us extra food, I always had that in mind in the back of my head when I made the hamotzi that uh, I wasn't completely, just because they removed the tray doesn't mean the meal was over. There's, there was always the possibility of more food coming out when you're at a guest's, when you're at a host's home. Okay, let us go weiter. Amar Rav Haragil B'Shemin Shemin Ma'akva. So now we have a related halacha, which is at what point is the meal really over, such that no more food is allowed without a new bracha. So Rav says that if you normally uh, anoint your fingers at the end of the meal before benching, 
with uh, fragrant oil. People used to do that. Remember, in those days, you didn't have the same kind of eating utensils that we have today. So you'd typically be eating like really greasy food with your fingers. Your fingers got dirty. There was no soap. There was water, but there was no, the, no not the same kind of no detergents. Forks and knives. No forks and knives, right? Unless you eat fish, you know, you had smell. You ate fish. Know? It was pretty, pretty stinky, <laughs> <laughs> especially if you had the fish with the kutach and all that chazerai, <laughs> right? right? And so um, your fingers, would you'd want to uh, deodorize your fingers after a meal. So typically you would pour some fragrant oil on your fingers and they would ni make a nice smell and then you would go ahead and bench. So once you put the fragrant oil on your fingers, then you've committed yourself to benching and you can't, you can't eat anymore. Is that the source of my machram? No, we're going to talk about my machram. My is special halacha, but we're going to get to that in just a moment. Amar Ravashi ki havinon be Rav Kahana, Amar Lan ki gon anon de ragilinon be mishcha mishav ma'ak velon. And Ravashi, uh, Rav Kahana, uh, Ravashi said, uh, or Rav Kahana said to us, that would be true of us because we always add fragrant oil to our fingers and therefore, once you've, uh, the, uh, until you put that fragrant oil on, you have not committed yourself to bench yet. The meal is not officially over. Veles hilchisa kechol hanishmaitsa, but the halach is not like any of these pre-stated uh, uh, cases of removing the tray or putting oil on your fingers. That doesn't determine when the meal is officially over. When is the meal officially over? Ela kiha da amar rebi chia bar ashi amar rav shalosh techif osein. But rather, um, uh, um, Rav had said that there are three things that are immediately adjacent to, 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 the, to the following thing. What are they? Teichaf l'smicha shechita, that immediately after you do smicha, which is pressing down on a live animal before you bring it as a carbon, immediately afterwards you have to shech the animal in the Beis HaMikdash. Teichaf l'geula tefillah, immediately after you finish the bracha of Gaal Yisrael in your shacharis, you have to immediately go to start the Shmonas, right? And take a flinatilos yadayim bracha, and immediately after you wash my machronim, then you have to immediately go to benching. So you really, the meal is not officially over until you wash my machronim. That's really the statement of the Gemara. It's not, the criterion is not when they remove the tray. The criterion is not when you add the fragrant oil, but the criterion is when you wash my machronim. That's, that's, that's the criterion. Abaya said we can also add another takef, another adjacency, that immediately after Talmidei Chachamim comes blessing. What does that mean? That if a person has a Talmud Chacham in his home and hosts a Talmud Chacham, immediately afterwards bracha comes. As Lavan said to Yaakov, that Hashem has blessed me because of you, because I've had you in my home. Ibois Ema Mehacha, or alternatively from here, Shanamar Vayivarach Hashem is based on Mitzri, Biglal Yosef, that God blessed the house of Potiphar because he had Yosef in his home. So, what's that? Are busy this Shabbos? I invite you for Shabbos. Thank you, that's very nice of you. Anyway, so have a Talmud Chacham in your house, you'll get Bracha. You'll get, uh, but what are the logistics? I know because in your house, it does, doesn't say when you bench. No, no, no. This is no, just no, an agadic addition oh, oh, to oh. just just a common uh, a, a common theme a common thread of all of these things is this comes after that benching comes after my machronim and bracha comes after having a talmud chacham in your house like they come immediately after okay so now the mishnah says let's go on to the next mission berich al hayayin shalifnei hamazam poteres hayayin shalachar hamazam if a person makes a bracha on wine before the meal, he exempts the need for a bracha after, on wine after the meal. Now, now the uh, Rashi explains to us again, the cultural standard back then was that you'd be a guest in someone's home, and before the guests would be seated, it was customary to bring them into some kind of antechamber, and you'd bring out, what do you call the cocktail wine? The, the aperitif. Aperitif. Oh, oof, such a connoisseur we have over here. They'd bring out an aperitif wine which was sort of like to, uh, to get your appetite, to whet your appetite, to whet your palate, and, uh, and they would also sometimes bring out little snacks as well, like uh, basically hors d'oeuvres, okay? Yes. And um, I wonder, they didn't call them hors d'oeuvres, they called them parperes, that's really a, a term for like a little snack or an hors d'oeuvre. So uh, if, you, if you make the bracha of bar pri on your aperitif, so then if they bring you out a dessert wine, what is that called, Howard? A dessert wine? Yeah. 
Uh, is that called an after teeth? Is that was that what it's called? <laughs> it's, it's something that I'd say. We have a guy who knows it, Rabbi. Sherry or port is it? Sherry or port, but there's a special what name for it. Is it? it then. Yeah, or yeah, sherry or port or um, a riesling, I think, also is a is a dessert wine. Riesling. Yeah. Riesling or riesling. White, riesling. White, uh, white, yeah. yeah. But what's yeah. a generic term for that? That's what. Yeah, that's what. The, that's what I want to know. Right. I don't know. Okay, if anyone's watching on kosher too, oh, please send us an email. <laughs> All right. Oh, you have a trouble there. All right. uh, anyway, so the dessert wine is also, you don't have to make a new bracha on the dessert wine because you made your Borifriya Geffen on the aperitif. Okay, Berat ala parperish alifnei hamazon, pateras ala parperish ala achar hamazon. And similarly, if you made a bracha on the hors d'oeuvres that come before the meal, then you exempt the um, sort of the dessert items that come after the meal. Now, what dessert items and what kinds of hors d'oeuvres are we talking about? That's the subject of a debate between Rashi and Tosfos, which will become clear in just a moment. Berich al hapas poteris al parperis, al parperis lo poteris al pas. If a person makes a bracha on bread, he exempts parperis, he exempts these parperis, these snack items. And it's not clear what these snack items are. Now, Rashi says, that they would be like the cocktail items, the hors d'oeuvre items that you bring out for the guests when they would drink their aperitif. And Rashi says the example of these things are like those little um, quail or partridge meat uh, that we talked about before. The problem that Toysvus has with that is, well, of course, hamotzi is going to cover that. And what's even more problematic is ala parperes la patres apas. The Mishnah says that if you make a bracha on the parperes, that bracha does not help you be yotze, your hamotzi. Well, that should be obvious. It's a shahakol that you're making on a piece of meat, on a, on a piece of chicken. In, uh, some sort of dough. Well, so <laughs> then, so, but, but then Rashi doesn't say that. So that's the thing, is that Satosvus so concludes that the parperis that we're discussing is some kind of mizonos item. And Tosfa suggests that it's pas tsunuma, which is a term that we learned about before. It's like a bread pudding, which has lost its turisa denaham, it's lost its bread form, and as a result you make a mizonos and not a hamotzi. And furthermore, it's not meant as a filling meal item, it's meant as a snack item or a dessert item. And as a result, it, could, it was typically used as a four spice or as an hors d'oeuvre or as a dessert. And therefore, uh, the Chiddush of the Mishnah is, is that if you make hamotzi, then since this thing could sometimes be eaten together with the meal as well, you don't have to make a special bracha on the parperis. But if you make a bracha just on the parperis, even though it has a dough aspect to it, but since it's not bread, the mizanos that you made does not cover the, the hamotzi that you need to make <coughs> in the bread. But okay. the four spice, you haven't washed it anyway, so how could they even have this argument? But you're sitting well, in the yacht chamber having your aperitif with a little, uh, a little thing. It right. doesn't matter whether it's mizanos or whatever it is. You haven't washed yet. I mean, you haven't well, washed we haven't, so, but it could be. Maybe you did wash. Maybe you washed. In other words, we haven't even learned the halachas of washing yet and whether that, re whether that will stop you from being yotze a bracha or not. But in any event, our mission is just talking about, maybe let's say you're talking about a situation where you washed, and then you went into the antechamber, and then you made a mazinus. So the Chiddush of the Mishnah is that don't think that that's going to be enough. You'd have to make a separate hamotzi on your bread. Beishamai omrim aflomai sekedera. Beishamai say that it, it's, it doesn't even work. Your parperis bracha will not even work for my sekedera, which is that cooked cereal with the chopped wheat kernels that we talked about before. The Gemara will explain what, why the, what that, the meaning of that phrase of Beishamai is. Hayyoshvin kolechem mevarech la'atzmo, heisevu echem mevarech la'kola. Next halacha. If you have a group of people that are sitting together, every person has to bench to himself, and you cannot have what we call a zimun or a communal benching. And the reason it seems like is because reclining is necessary in order for us to be considered eating together, because as again, I, the cultural standards have changed since then. Today, when we sit together, that's called communal eating because we all sit around the same table. But back then, because every person had his own little couch and his own little tray, unless you were actually reclining on the couch, you were not considered to be eating together. And therefore, it's just sitting was not sufficient. And, and therefore, only if they recline can one person lead the benching and have a communal benching for everyone. Balahem yayin b'soch hamazon. Next, if wine comes in the middle of the meal, you've already washed and made hamotzi, 
So kolecha vechad mivarech la'atzno. Then every person, since it's in the middle of the meal, has to make his own bari pri hagaf. And tomorrow we'll explain why. But achar hamaz and echad mivarech l'kulam. But if it's after the meal that wine comes, um, one person can be motzi everyone else in the bari pri hagafen. Vehu omer al hamugmar ve'afal pishen mevinas hamugmar l'lachar suda. And furthermore, this is a rule of etiquette that the Mishnah says that the person who makes the bari pri hagafen at, at the end of the meal to be motzi everyone else is also given the honor of making the bracha on the incense. It was very common. Again, you'd have perhaps uh, uh, certain odors as a result of the food. And so it was common that after benching was over, you would uh, burn some incense to give sort of like a pleasant fragrance in the house as everyone would be sitting by the fire, right? And so you'd have to make a bracha of borei atzei v'samim. And so you would typically honor and the Mishnah says this is the appropriate thing to do, to honor the person who was motzi, everyone in the Bore Priyagafen, you let him make the bracha of Bore Yatsev And again, the Mishnah, the Gemara will explain later why that is. If he's the, in what? If he's in Babel. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends what kind of incense. Amar Rabba Bar Barchana, Amar Rabbi Yechanan, Lo Shanu Ela Bishabasos V'yomim Toivim, that this halacha, <coughs> that we said that if you make a bracha on wine, as your aperitif, uh, the, 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 the pre-meal wine, you don't have to make any more brachas on the wine that's brought for dessert. That's only true on Shabbos and Yantuf, Ho'el ve'adam koveya sudasa al-hayayin, because it's very common on Shabbos and Yantuf to have wine throughout the meal. And therefore, there's an expectation that when I make my bracha on my aperitif, there's gonna, it's not gonna just going to be this glass. There's going to be much more wine that's going to be served throughout the meal. Aval bishar yimos hashana mevarach al kol kos v'kos. But during the rest of the year, if it's during a weekday, unless you're an alcoholic, typically you don't have more than just one, that one little glass of wine before the meal. Any additional wine they bring out was unexpected, and it was therefore not in mind when you made the bracha bore pri hagafen, so you'd have to make a new bore pri hagafen. So itmar nami, amar rabba bar mori, amar rabbi yeshua ben levi, lo shanu ela bishabas v'yamim toivim, that again, he says the same thing, that this is only true on Shabbos and Yom Tov, but he adds also that on days that you go to the bathhouse and get a real good schwitz, so sometimes you need to be revived with wine, so it was typical to have meal with an abundance of wine. And the same thing was true after you did some, a, a nice good bloodletting. It was typical that you would need to replenish your, uh, your body with wine, and so therefore making one bracha at the beginning will cover all the additional wine because there's an expectation that there'll be more wine on the way. But during the rest of the year, at a regular meal during the week, you have to make a bracha on each new glass because it was not expected. Rabbi Barmari Bar came to Rabbi's house during the week. He noted that he made a bracha on the aperitif wine, and then he made another bracha on the wine after the meal. And Amalei Yiyasher and he said, good gezak, that's actually the proper thing to do. And so did Rabbi Shubin Levi say that that's the halacha. Rabbi Yitzchak bar Yosef iklu lebe abaye biyom tov. And here we have another story, but Rabbi Yitzchak bar Yosef <coughs> comes to Abaye's house on Yom Tov. Now this is Yom Tov, remember. We, what did we say about Yom Tov? There's an expectation that there's going to be a, a, a wine throughout the meal, so one bracha should suffice. But Chazi the al kol kasa v'kasa. But he saw Abaye not doing that. He saw Abaye making a bracha on each and every new glass of wine. So Amar Leib, Lo Sarver, Lo Mar, Lo Hadri, Bishu, Ben Levi. Don't you hold the Rabbi Shub and Levi that you only have to make one bracha because the rest of the wine is expected? Amar Lei, Nimlach Ana. So Rabbi said, no, you see, I'm not a drinker. And therefore, in my home, we don't serve a lot of wine. So the fact that they brought out extra wine was a surprise for me. I didn't have it in mind when I made my initial Bari Priyagafen, and therefore I had to make a new bracha. Wouldn't, Rabbi, that, be, wouldn't that be the main criteria? Would a person has a mind? Absolutely. So that's what Abaya was. That's right. exactly so what Abaya was telling us. Shabbos, not Shabbos. Really well, so, I mean, so the Gemara is just telling us that these are the, the these are the general cultural standards uh, that uh, that were that were prevalent at the time. That uh, on Shabbos and Yom Tov, it could also be telling us Derech Eretz that on Shabbos and Yom Tov, Taki, you should have lots of wine, and during the rest of the week, don't be uh, don't be a glutton for wine. I mean, it could be that that's the, sort of the subliminal message of this Gemara as well. Get drunk in in the preceding uh, Gemara, Rabbi, when you said that Rabbi Barmari visited the Rabbi's home, and yeah. Rabbi said the bracha over the wine twice, 
Should uh, we assume that there was a bracha achrona in between the two? No, no, no because no because achrona. everything will be covered by benching as we okay, learned before. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Now we So the question is now raised. So up until now, we've been learning about the aperitif wine, the, the cocktail wine, and that covers the bracha for the wine that comes after the meal. But what we haven't discussed is the wine that you drink during the meal. What happens if the first wine that they actually bring you is the meal wine, the, 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 your, your, your Merlot that you use to wash down the, um, your sandwich or your fish or uh, is Merlot with fish? I thought it's with beef, with steak. No, you have a good, you have a good Chardonnay with uh, with fish. Come on, Harold. Get, 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 get with the program. Anyway, so the question is, if you make a bracha on, if you make a bracha on the wine during the meal, will that cover the wine that you drink after the meal? So what's 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 the shaila? So im tim shalom or verech al hayayin shalifnei amazon poter sayayin shalacher amazon yishum dezel lishtos dezel lishtos of al hacha dezel lishtos dezel lishros lo. So maybe the, the suffix is like this. Maybe the function of the wine that is used as the aperitif is consistent with the function of wine that's used after the meal, and therefore the bracha on one will cover the bracha on the other. But the bracha, the wine that you drink during the meal, is not for uh, drinking, but it's rather really to help wash down the meal that you're, that you're eating. It's to help you digest it better and, to, and for it to go down better. And as a result, you could argue that that's not the same function. Functionally, there are two different kinds of wine. And therefore, the bracha that you make on the wine during the meal may not be able to cover the wine that you have as your dessert wine. So, odil maloshna, or maybe it makes no difference. So, rav amar poter, rav kahana amar eno poter, rav nachman amar poter, rav shishas amar eno poter. You see, clearly we have this back and forth machlokas among the Amoraim, rav huna, rav yehuda, v'chol tamidi, the rav amri eno poter, and the rav yehuda and all of the students of rav say that no, the bracha on the wine during the meal does not cover the wine that is the dessert wine after the meal. Eis they rav rav nachman, so rav challenges rav nachman, uh, because rav nachman says that it does cover. And he says, how could you say that it covers? Look at our Mishnah. The last lines of our Mishnah were, Bala him yayin v'soch hamazon, kol echa v'echad mevarech la'atzmo. And la'achar hamazon, echad mevarech l'kulam. So it says in our Mishnah that if wine comes during the meal, every person makes his own bari priyagafen. And then if wine comes after the meal, one person makes the bari priyagafen for everyone. So the assumption is, is that our Mishnah is talking about the very same meal. And you see that the bracha that you made during the meal on the wine does not cover the wine that you make after the meal. Cause then, uh, because otherwise, if it did, why then would there even be an issue of one person making a bracha for everyone? You've already made your bracha in the middle of the meal. Rav Nachman responded, that's, uh, no, you're misinterpreting the mission. The mission is not talking about the same meal. It's not saying that during the same meal, after they had brought wine during the meal, they afterwards brought wine after the meal. It's talking about two different cases. In the case where they brought wine during the meal, each one makes his own bracha. And in a case where the only wine that was brought was brought after the meal, then one person makes a bracha for all. But in Achinami, if they had wine both during the meal and after the meal, the bracha that you make during the meal would suffice. That's Rav Nachman's interpretation. So, uh, the Mishnah had said that if you make a bracha on bread, you exempt the parperis. We said according to Tosfos, this was this past sinuma, this bread pudding that's a mezoinus. But ala parperis la poteris ha past. But if you make a bracha on the parperis, you do not uh, cover the bread and you have to make a separate hamotzi. And beshamai omrim aflomai sekeder. And beshamai say that this is true also with your hot cereal, your hot cooked cereal. So the question is, what does Beishamai say? Iboyelahu Beishamai aresha pligi o dilma asefi pligi. So the question is like this, what is Beishamai arguing with? Is he arguing with the first statement or the second statement? De ka'amr tanakama berech ala pas poteres ar parperes, the kol shikein maise kedera. So let's look at it this way. One, one way of interpreting it is like this, that when the tanakama says that if you make a bracha on bread, you also exempt the parperis, even though the parperis really is not a, a main meal item normally, but it's enough of a nutritive item such that by making a bracha on the bread, you also cover the parperis. And certainly that's true that it covers cooked cereal because cooked cereal is more also of a main uh, meal item, and therefore the bread would cover that as well. We also say, Beishamay Lameymar, Lomibaya parperis, Lopatrulahu pas. 
And that's where Beishama is coming to argue, and he says, no, not only does the Hamotzi not cover the Parperis, but it, it even doesn't cover Maisa Kedera. It even doesn't cover cooked cereal, because Beishama is of the opinion, you have to be very machmir, that bread only covers things that are eaten directly with the bread, and not other things that will come during the main course. O Dilma, so that's one way of looking at it, or Dilma, or maybe no, Asefa plea. Maybe Beishamai is arguing with the second line, the Ketani Berach ala Parperes Lepateres Apas, which was that according to the Tanakama, if you make a bracha on Parperes, you do not cover the bread. You have to make a, a, a separate Hamotzi. So on that, the Tanakama is saying, Pasu de Lopater, Volmaisi Kedera Potar, that Parperes does not cover bread. But, by implication, it does cover things that are perhaps less than actual bread, and therefore if you make a mezainus on your parperis, you don't have to make a separate mezainus on your cooked cereal. And on that, Beishamai says no, because since parperis is more of a dessert item, and your cooked cereal is more of a main meal item, therefore the bracha of mezainus on the parperis will not cover the, um, the hot cereal. That's the question that the Gemara has. What is Beis Shammai disagreeing with? Is it disagreeing with the first part of the Mishnah or the second part of the Mishnah? And on that the Gemara says, take, we'll have to let that sit, we're not really sure. Now we go to the next part of the Mishnah. The Mishnah had said, if uh, a group of people were sitting together and not reclining, then they have to bench separately. They cannot have a communal zima, a communal benching. So he say bu in lo he say bu lo. So you mean to tell me only if they recline, but if they don't recline, not or a minhu. So let's raise a contradiction. Asara shahi holchim baderech. That if ten people were were traveling together, afal pi shekulam ochla mikikar echad. Even if all of them are sharing the same loaf of bread, kolecha bechad mevarech laasma. Since they're they're not seated together, each person has to bench separately, even if they shared from the same loaf. However, Yashvu Lechol, but if they sat down to eat together, Afal Pisha Kolecha Bechad Ochol Miki Karo, Echad Mevarech Lukula. Then even if each one is eating from a separate loaf of bread, they can still have a communal benching since they sat down together. So what do you see from here? That Katani Yashvu, Afal Pisha Lohe Sebu. It says that as long as they're seated together, even if they're not reclining, then that's enough to create a communal situation where they, one person can bench for all of them. So that's a direct spira <coughs> to our Mishnah, which says that sitting is not enough, you have to recline. Sorry, I, we're not talking about Simon, are we? Yeah, that's so what we're talking about. Well, so if it's, let's say the, uh, uh, the case of no Zeman, someone's bench and have somebody else be you like that? So the Rishonim say, we're going to really analyze this more carefully when we get to the seventh parak, which is all about the laws of Birkas Hamazan and Zimun. But really, if two people are eating and you don't have a zimun, each person has to bench by himself. One it's, one it's only if you're dealing with an illiterate person that only in that situation, like a bidievit situation, where one person could be motzi the other. But, but there's a difference between one person being motzi the other and what we call a communal blessing. Those are two different things. And here we're talking about... Here we're talking about a communal blessing, which is where one person recites the benching aloud, and all others answer amen, not so, not so much to be yoytze. That, that's the concept that you and I are more familiar right. with. Here this is what we call a communal bracha, a, a communal birka samazim, which is really what the purpose of a zimun is. Not so much that we want, it's, we want one person to be motzi everyone, but rather that we should all be considered to have a communal bracha. Okay? So anyway... So, so we see the kasha, we have a stira. One, our mission implies that sitting is insufficient, and the b'risa states that si- sitting is sufficient. So, Amar of Nachman bar Yitzchak kegon da Amri nezel v'necho lachma beduch plan. He says, the answer is, is that in that b'risa, before they sat down together, they publicly announced that we're going to be seated together for a, a communal meal at such and such a place. In that situation, where they made that announcement beforehand, sitting is sufficient. But if they did not make that announcement beforehand, then only reclining will allow a communal, a communal benching. Kinoch nafshe de Rav, Azlul Talmid of Basrei. So when Rav passed away, all of his students accompanied him to the base so they, 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 uh, they escorted him, they did the Levaya. And Kihaji Amri, Nezel v'necho lachma on a hard dunk. So as they were leaving, when on their way back to town, they said, let's all stop and sit down for a meal by the, uh, by the river dunk. 
So Basar de Karchi Yashvi Vikami Bayalahu He Seba Dafka Tananavo Yashvulo O Dilma Kave and Rabinazal Venechal Rifta Baduchta Planisa Ki He Sebu Dami. So then they sat down to eat and when it was time to bench they had the question. W- are we allowed to have a communal benching or not? Is it because we said let's all sit down and, and uh, eat together by, by a certain place, is that enough to create a communal setting? Or since we didn't recline, are we not allowed to have a communal benching? We each have to bench uh, individually. So lo they didn't know the answer to this question. And come Rav Adabar Ahava, so Rav Adabar Ahava was one of the chief disciples of Rav, arose and ahadar kari la'achure v'kara kriya achrina. And he was so distraught that Rav, their Rebbe, who had just passed away, was not there for them to consult, to answer their shaila, that he felt that this was really the, a new sense of, of mourning and loss, because this was the first time that they had a shaila that they couldn't get an answer to because their Rebbe, Rav, was not there. So he took his garment, which already had Kriya. He already, already torn Kriya for his Rebbe. He turned it backwards and tore another Kriya on the backside of the shirt just to express that, and he said, uh, He says, Oi, Rav has passed away, and we have not sufficiently learned the halachas of Birkas HaMazon to know what to do. So this really, truly is where the loss is most palpable when we have a shayla and we don't have the Rebbe to ask. Until an elderly man came along in Ramalahu Masnis and Abraisa, and he showed that there was a contradiction between our Mishnah and the Brisa that we just quoted, and he gave the same answer that we just gave that as long as they said, let us dine at a certain place before the meal, then sitting is sufficient to create a communal setting and to allow one person to bench for everyone. Have a wonderful day.